we decided to move to Hiroko. Mm -hmm. This so, was a long time ago. Yeah, a long time ago. What's what's the deal with Hiroko? Okay, so Hiroko is a platform as a service. All right. Meaning that Hiroko knows basically how a Django project or a Rails project or whatever uh, needs to be deployed, and it is providing the necessary tools. Yeah. So by by, by necessary tools, uh, we mean a couple of things. Hello everyone and welcome back to Hackcast. This is episode number nine. I am Rado. I'm Ivo. And we are once again at our studio at Hacksoft's office. And first of all, we want to say a big thank you to all of you because we received quite a lot of positive feedback for our last two episodes. Episode number seven about Django and episode number eight about Django community and Django style guide. We received a lot of comments. We received a lot of likes, views, uh, of course, comments and positive feedback so we're quite happy about it yep yep and because this is the case we will continue the jungle topic for episode number nine and we're going to talk about jungle deployment all right but before we start talking about jungle deployment where ivo is going to be the lead role and is going to do most of the talking and i'm just going to ask questions all right we have two things to do do you know do you know what we need to do um to ask teddy if you're recording Yes, that is recording, but first of all... Uh, happy birthday to Ivailo. Oh, my birthday! <laughs> he uh, celebrated his, should we say? Yeah. 30th birthday? Yeah. Yesterday? Well, already 30, yeah. Yeah, so uh, welcome to the club, starting with three. Thank you. Uh, when we were testing this with Teddy, uh, it went... More, more smoothly, but uh, <laughs> we will fix it in the editing. All right. So this was this was the confetti in the script. <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> so we needed to have confetti for his birthday. And the second thing that we want to say is that for our final episode for season two, as you know, we're doing 10 episodes per season. For our final episode, the next episode, we're going to do a special one where we're going to answer your questions. We're going to gather all questions that you have for us, and we're going to try answering them. So please go to our videos and just post somewhere a question. We're going to gather them, we're going to prepare, and we're going to provide meaningful answers and uh, help us uh, collect enough questions to have content for 20, 30 minutes uh, Hacksoft episode. And yeah, that's I think that's about it. We can start with Django deployment. All right. So if we are talking about deployment, we need to, basically we need to cover what are the options. Mm -hmm. And after this, we need to discuss what are our preferences uh, in Hacksoft? All right. I will drop the bomb and say that deploying Django is probably one of the major downsides of the whole framework. Okay. Why? Uh, because first of all, it is it is complex and complicated. Okay. It's not easy to deploy a Django project in a proper way. Okay. And it's way more expensive than, than let's say, dropping a WordPress site on on a shared hosting. All right, so sure, if yeah. you're coming with some kind of PHP background and you're used to pay two or three dollars a month for a shared hosting to place your uh, website or your uh, uh, WordPress website or whatever, uh, this is definitely not going to be the case with Django. Okay. So w what are the challenges with Django, the, with deploying Django? Okay. So first of all, you need to choose your uh, WHGI or, S or ASGI uh, HTTP server. All right. And if you don't have a solid background with Django, this is basically, I'm just betting on Unicorn without even knowing what Unicorn is doing. I'm just betting on this, putting the uh, one-liner that I got from the internet and hope it works. Uh, one-liner of what? what, what one-liner of a command that just triggers the uh, whole Django and keeps it alive. Okay, so let's let's unpack this. We, we have Django, which is a framework for building web applications with Python. Mm -hmm. And Python has those uh, interfaces, uh, Wisgi and Tasgi, yes, basically, which are not Django specific, but rather Python specific for deploying web applications. Mm -hmm. And in order to deploy a uh, Wisgi or Asgi web application, you usually do it with something uh, that's like like that's like Unicorn. Yes. So what exactly is Unicorn? Well, G Unicorn, or we call it Unicorn. Unicorn. Yeah. yeah, we call it Unicorn. There are other options. You need yeah. to you need to make your decision and use one of them, which is a little bit hard to do if you're not really understand what these options are, what are the benefits, what All are right. the downsides. Uh, and this this whole thing makes it a little bit harder to just 
get your Django and deploy it. So, so the unicorn is the server that keeps the Django alive. It gets the HTTP request and sends it to the Django uh, code. And All right. At the end, it get the response and translate it to an HTTP response. All right. So it's it's basically what handles the HTTP incoming HTTP requests. Yes. It keeps uh, an instance or instances of Django running, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of instances of the Django application running. Passes the HTTP request to Django and then gets the response and returns the response back. Yes, and Django as itself as a as a framework is a little bit on the memory heavy side. Okay, meaning that if you want to have your uh, Django server up and running, you are looking at at least uh, five hundred megabytes of RAM. At least, oh yeah, at, at, at least, least, at least. Yeah. So, so there is not an option where you can get a shared hosting with, let's say, a hundred megabytes of RAM or something, and be confident you, that your, your Django project is going to be okay. All right. So, uh, oh, and we we bet on Gunicorn because it's stable and mature and actually gets the job done. Yes, it works. Yeah. Uh, what else do you need? Well, well, th there are plenty of options for how to approach, but uh, let's start with let's start with uh, basically uh, VMs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, yeah, more most people that are new to the uh, Django realize yeah. that there is no like out of the box solution where you just place your project and it it just works. Mm -hmm. So they start to uh, get servers organized and uh, set up things mm, by hand. All right. So they get virtual private servers, VPS. All right. Uh, you can get. A cheap one for five to five to seven bucks a month, uh, and host yeah. a simple Django project on it. So we, when we started doing Django, I remember that we were hosting our projects on DigitalOcean. Yes, we were buying uh, VMs. They call it droplets. Droplets. Yeah. yeah. And we were. Uh, this was basically the basis for our infrastructure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But in order to set up your Django project on a, on a plain VPS, you yeah. need a lot of things and you need a lot of things to know and truly understand how they work in order to to set them up so right. first of all you need to figure out how to actually get your code there okay yeah you need to get your project you can ssh to the server git git pull it or you may try to initialize a bare git repo where you can actually push your code to directly okay but you need to first of all you need to do this in order to get your code on the actual virtual private server that's only for you all right uh, i remember that we were doing it with git Yes, most of the time you are doing it with Git, uh, setting some kind of authentication. There's basically a bare Git uh, repository that we just yep. push there. Yep. Which which actually works. Then you need something to uh, keep your uh, your uh, Django server running, your Unicorn process running. So whenever the VM restarts, or if you uh, if if for some reason it it, it crashes and needs to um, reboot, you need something a, a supervisor. Yep. That keeps the pro the process on, and with each and different uh, Linux distribution, it is a different story to set this up. Yeah, so it is a little bit of complexity that you need to understand. And we are know, running Kubuntu. Yes, Kubuntu in most servers. cases. We, yes, in most cases we are running Kubuntu, and there are different ways to set up your process as a daemon in order mm -hmm. to uh, be up and running all the time. You can do this with the uh, system D configuration. You yep. can use some third-party softwares to do this. There are a lot of ways. There are a lot of tutorials on the internet where you can follow them and set the Django, the uh, unicorn process to be up and running all the time and boots whenever the machine gets internet. Yeah, whenever the machine restarts or something happens yes. with the machine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then it's not a great idea to uh, expose your unicorn server directly to the internet. Yes. So most of the time, the requests are actually proxied by some kind of Apache or NGINX server. Yeah, I think it's it's called a reverse proxy. Yeah, yes, a reverse proxy, uh, which which again is another piece of software you need to install, configure, uh, deal with all the uh, things like um, setting up an SSH. Um, sorry, uh, SSL. Uh, yes, SSL certificate. Uh, configure your web server to to use the SSL certifi certificate. If you're using some kind of Let's Encrypt self-signed certificate that uh, needs to be re-signed every three months or something, you need to set up yeah. this thing on the VM too, which is another bunch of software, another another couple of things you need to know and understand. Then you need your database running somewhere. In yeah. some cases, it's running in the same machine. In some cases, it's running in the, in 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 another machine. Yeah. Maybe you can be using uh, like uh, software as a service database. Yeah. Uh, but on a lot of cases, we have uh, we we used to um, have um, uh, Postgres running in the same machine. 
Which is not optimal and not a good practice. Definitely not all. optimal. Yeah, you need to take care of uh, backing up your database. You need to take care that it is there, it's working, and it is, you know, 100% up there. Yeah. And when it comes to actually using Celery, you need to set up three, uh, two more processes. Yes. You need the Celery Beats and you need the uh, Celery Worker set up that... Yep. You can have them in the same machine. You can have them in uh, other VMs if you want. But again, then you're facing another challenge and so on, getting the actual code base on multiple multiple machines. Yes. And basically, it's a lot of work to set up a Django project properly working on a VM by itself. Yeah, and it, so the, the overall picture is you need at least two machines, one for the database, mm -hmm. one for the application. On the application machine, you need... Uh, to set Nginx as a reverse proxy, configure Gunicorn and have something that uh, takes care of Gunicorn when the machine restarts. Mm -hmm. um, uh, figure out how to get your code there and how to actually do deployments, meaning data code. Yes. Um, what else? If you if you are running with Celery, this means perhaps one more machine just for just for Celery and the managing Redis. Yes. Really. You you need something as a message broker or message broker yeah. or RabbitMQ. It can be on the same server. It can be on another server. Yeah, but at the end of the day, we are looking at around five or six different processes that, yes. most, in most cases, are living in different machines. Yes, which makes the whole picture really complicated. And you you need to you need to administer this. You need uh, dedicated resources and uh, um, DevOps or sysadmins, uh, whatever you call it, uh, to in order to handle this. And you need to figure out the mon uh, the monitoring of, of all of it. Yes, then you need to set up logging. Uh, and yeah, and it's if you have, I think if you have, if you have the resources and the knowledge, sometimes it's a good idea to run with uh, plain VMs mm -hmm. and do the things the way you like to do them. Yeah. Uh, but sometimes when you don't have this resource and you want to optimize the deployment procedure and like minimize the room for error, because if you are running with VMs, then you need to start giving people access and figure out the deployment pipeline, mm -hmm. which by itself is another thing that com that complicates that complicates yes. the picture. Uh, then there, I think there are better, uh, better solutions. And at some point we migrated from running on digital ocean and droplets. I, I think we were uh, automating everything with, it was first chef. Then we went to Ansible. Yes. Ansible is what we use to set up yeah. everything needed on the VMs. Exactly. Uh, but I would say that we have seen a lot of a lot of teams, a lot of people that a lot of teams that uh, has a person with the uh, grant access to the VMs, and mm -hmm. this is the only one that can deploy, yeah. which is not great in terms of team productivity. Yeah, in the team there is someone that has the access, can SSH to the servers, do some magic there that no one understands, and deploys the project, yeah. which is truly against our uh, like rhythm of software development. Yeah, in most of the cases, we would like to deploy like a couple times a day. Yeah, we want to rely on uh, continuous integration. Uh, we want to have pipelines, and we want to be able to do basic operations on our infrastructure. Uh, we want everyone to be able to do basic operations on our infrastructure, like uh, read the logs, change an environment variable, mm -hmm. for for, mm -hmm. for example, for staging to to to, to test something, mm -hmm. uh, and we want everyone to be able to troubleshoot basic infrastructure problems. Yes. Yeah, and this was the reason that we decided to move to Hiroko. Mm -hmm. This so, was a long time ago. Yeah, a long time ago. What's what's the deal with Hiroko? Okay, so Hiroko is a platform as a service. All right. Meaning that Hiroko knows basically how a Django project or a Rails project or whatever uh, needs to be deployed and it is providing the necessary tools. Yeah. So by, by, by necessary tools, uh, we mean a couple of things. Yeah. First of all, it is giving you a load balancer and a way to uh, deploy your Django project on multiple machines. Mm -hmm. That's, that makes the project uh, a lot more scalable in terms of traffic. Yeah. You can upscale or downscale your, uh, the, the, the amount of web servers you have. So the load balancer, if we have to compare with our previous setup, it's basically the reverse proxy or the Nginx. Yes. And it's coming by default from Heroku. You don't have to do anything about it. Yes. And it is set up in a different machine, different different place. It's not on your main web worker's computer. Yeah. That makes the whole, the whole picture horizontally scalable. Yeah. Meaning that you can 
you can get as much as you would like uh, web uh, servers mm -hmm. to uh, accept the request and actually do the work. The incoming traffic is handled by Heroku and then it gets redirected to your to whatever it's running on your um, Heroku platform. Yes. And it got a nice concept of having uh, uh, just just one file where you define yeah. your processes. The so-called proc file? Proc file, yeah. So you can say, I want uh, one process to be the uh, unicorn process. The web one? The web one. I want one background worker. I want another background worker that yeah. is going to be the uh, scheduler, the, yeah. the, the, the beats process. Then, I, then let's say I want uh, two more uh, uh, worker types that are for uh, heavy tasks and lightweight tasks or yeah. something like this. It's really easy to uh, create uh, new lines in this file yeah. that is actually creating new uh, uh, new new servers. New Basically, new, yeah, they call it dynos. Dynos, so, yeah, yeah. But these are new uh, containers running somewhere in the cloud on uh, Heroku. Uh, and they're, they're using KWS as a, um, uh, yeah. engine, as a compute provider. Uh, and this makes the whole the whole thing really really easy to deploy if you yeah. if you know Heroku and the things are documented pretty well. Yeah. Uh, so so it's basically an easier way to uh, set up a Django without hustling with um, creating VMs and setting them up. Yeah, it removes the the direct need of doing system administration. Mm -hmm. uh, and the thing that I really like about Heroku was that they were running the concept of containers. Uh, way before Docker uh, became popular. Yes. And the general idea is that you deploy, you, you have a build step, something that builds your application, installs the requirements, checks if everything's correct. And if this entire build step is successful, then it's going to be rolled out and the previous version is going to be swapped. Mm -hmm. And it gives you a really nice way to roll back, to swap back to something that that's been working if you find out that you've deployed something that's not good. Yeah. And it also has the concept of, all right, Django is very important whenever you're deploying something new to run migrations in case mm -hmm. you have mm -hmm. changed in models. Mm -hmm. And it has the concept of uh, a release phase. Yes. It's going to build the application and then it's going to run the release phase, which is basically the migrations. Mm -hmm. Migrations are running in a transaction by default. So in case something happens during the release phase and migrations fail, the transaction is going to be rolled back, meaning you're going to have a good database state. And then the new build is not going to be released and you're going to remain with the old stable version. Meaning it's it's a good way to protect yourself from really nasty problems where the release succeeds, but the migration fails or vice versa. And then you are in a, a bad, bad state either with the database or with your code base. And then everything's returning 500 because mm -hmm. everything's just not working. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And they have a really good array of add-ons that you can just yeah. install. Extra services, yeah. Yeah, extra services. They Most of them are just software as a services just uh, bundled in a uh, plugin or add-on. Uh, yeah. So if you want, let's say, to install a Postgres add-on that is basically running your Postgres as a service, uh, dealing with the backups, dealing with basically everything on your Postgres, you just press a button and install it. Yep. If you want some kind of a, a, a message broker, two buttons yep. and you have... Uh, and Redis too. Yeah, and, and Redis, of course, some kind of advanced logging, some kind of almost all the things that you're probably going to need when setting up your project as a third-party services, they are bundled as a Heroku add-on. Yeah, uh, and they're managing the Postgres, they're managing Redis, they're managing the cloud AMPQ thing mm -hmm. that we usually use uh, as, as broker for, for Celery. And it's basically platform as a service, they're handling the infrastructure part for you and they're exposing a more developer friendly way to manage your infrastructure, manage your environment var variables, variables yeah. which is really good because uh, if you change something, then they're cycling, they're restarting everything. So mm -hmm. the new values will apply or this is something that uh, otherwise you need to do. You need to somehow, somehow figure uh, out how to do manually mm -hmm. if you're running on VMs. And uh, for me, Heroku enabled everyone to be able to troubleshoot infrastructure issues yes. and to be able to deal with infrastructure, yes. which is which is extremely uh, powerful because then you don't have bottlenecks mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for there are like two persons at, at the company who can uh, deal with this. And Heroku, uh, deploying Django on Heroku can uh, cover quite a lot of cases and can handle quite a lot of traffic. Yes. Uh, 
of course, there are cases where you'd like to have more control and more flexibility. We will get to that. Yeah. We will get to there. Yeah. Uh, what are some downsides of Heroku for you? Downsides. Basically, first downside is the um, not really flexible pricing. Yes. Uh, it is really nice when you are basically handling not a lot of traffic. Mm. And at the point where you start handling a lot of traffic, it just gets way more expensive than it should be, in my opinion. It is It is expensive, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a great for start, but mm -hmm. when you are actually facing a lot of traffic, that's the point where you're starting to think about migrating to somewhere else. Yeah, to some someplace else. Mm -hmm. uh, Heroku can handle for sure a lot of traffic. Uh, but it's expensive. And, but sometimes, and sometimes uh, the cost is justified. Sometimes you just need to have the performance uh, type of dynos. Yes. Uh, like the the performance L, mm -hmm. and then scale it scale it a bit. And then figure out the workers because Gunicorn it it relies on the concept of workers. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to have a good and scalable solution. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, there are things that you can do on application side. Uh, with Django to help yourself with this. And usually the database becomes a bottleneck at some point. Yes. Yeah. But you can scale the database if you want, but just you need to burn some more money. Yeah. And it's mostly sca scaling um, vertically. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you if you get to the point where you need horizontal scaling on the database, then you have other issues to solve mm -hmm, before mm -hmm. you get to the infrastructure. That's true. Yeah. But, and uh, about deployment. The other thing that I like about Heroku is that it's the deployment there is done via Git, mm -hmm. Git push Heroku master, mm -hmm. and we are usually we, we usually have a template for GitHub Actions. Yes, where we set up. It's actually uh, in our style guide example uh, where we have a setup for for deployment to Heroku, mm -hmm. and it works pretty good, and you can easily integrate it in your uh, CI. That's true. That's true. However, they are having some issues around permissioning. It's yes. not as granular as I would like to be. Yes. If I want to say something like, hey, I want these three team members to have access on um, to have access for, let's say, the logging and the metrics, but not having access to the environment variables, I don't think it's even possible with Heroku. I think if you go to the enterprise plan, <laughs> okay. it's going to be possible, but uh, their permissioning is not great mm -hmm. because, for example, in order for us to deploy from GitHub Actions, we need to obtain the so-called API key. Yes. And you, you put it in secrets uh, in GitHub, but still it's like a liability. If it someone is. gets this API key, it can have access to all, all the things that you have access as, as, as an account. Mm -hmm. And that's why we usually create special deployment accounts that have access only to this application. Yes and use the um, API keys of those special deployment accounts. But then again, you have to add the special deployment account. It, it may trigger you to go to the team or team plan, yeah. team plan or basically charge you more. Mm -hmm. And it's it's really inconvenient for me uh, having to do this, having to create a special account. Uh, we usually create it. Yeah, it was a special account just for the sake of uh, more security around deployment. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, Heroku can basically do something about it and uh, ship some features and make this more granular mm -hmm. and make it uh, so that we can easily um, set up access and security around uh, our apps there. Yeah, the thing that you just described feels like a bit a big hack that we are doing. It is. In order to in order to achieve a better security. It is, it is. Which which is strange to me. And you said that they can definitely develop uh, some some uh, new features in order to handle that. Yes. And speaking of devel developing features, I can't really remember a new feature for the last couple of years that's being deployed to Heroku. Yeah, the, the big feature that they shipped is Docker, Docker support. Wasn't it there before? No, no. Oh. They shipped Docker support, which for me, to be honest, it's not that big of a deal because uh, Heroku was dealing with con basically containers before this. Mm -hmm. And we tried... Uh, Deploying our Django projects with the Docker support on Heroku, but it was very, it, it was lacking features from the standard way of doing things. So mm. we went back to the standard way of doing things, and I see no reason to use Docker on uh, Docker on Heroku. All right, mm -hmm. makes sense, makes sense. Probably if you are relying on some native OS dependencies, like big ones, yeah, you don't want to deal with the um, 
creating a custom build pack rather than got it, got it. Yeah, making yeah, yeah. a custom yeah. Docker file. But yeah, the, I guess there are cases, but the truth is that the platform is yeah. not really being um, developed, like new things being brought in yeah. for the last couple of years. And that's why there are competitions uh, to Heroku coming along. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, for example, we migrated some of our things to Render. Yeah, render, Render.com. Dot, .io, I think? I think... Or it's the, .com. I think sure. it's .com. Okay, okay. Uh, and basically, there, there are a lot of other uh, platforms that do basically what Heroku, Heroku, but with more flexible pricing, let's say, or, to, yeah. or with a couple of new uh, features in there which is, for me, is definitely something that we are keeping an eye on. Why, why did we migrate to render? Not entirely, but some of our projects some of went the there. Projects, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, well, because we, first of all, wanted to give a try something something else. Yeah. And second of all, because, in my opinion, the render IO, the render.com pricing is way more flexible Okay. in terms of, I don't want to just make a big step in terms of price, just want a, a small step, yeah. you know. Uh, and in terms of resources, not only pricing, but in Heroku, you, you have like three or four tiers of uh, uh, machines that you can use. Yes. In Render, they're like way more, more way, more. way, way yeah. more. Yeah. And that, that's, that's the main reason. Uh, I don't think that any of the competition is there yet in terms of yeah. being as reliable as Heroku. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that Heroku is based on uh, AWS, meaning yeah. that every time AWS has some uh, issues with their with their services, Heroku is expecting issues too, which is, I guess, fine because AWS are are doing good. However, in many cases, Heroku is having issues while yeah. AWS is perfectly stable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That means that Heroku on their side messed up something, and yeah. this happens from time to time. For example, last time they had some 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 software issues with the GitHub integration; it was down yeah. for for months. I'm not sure about months, but it was. Uh, it felt like there were months, uh, like one or two months, where Heroku was having like different issues, but there were constantly new things breaking, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you uh, you could not deploy, or you could, or the, the apps were just down, yeah. or uh, some some third party service was not functioning as ex as expected. Yeah, and I think this kind of uh, degraded the trust in Heroku, mm -hmm. and at some point. Because for me, still, if we if we have a new project that we want to start working on, and it has a Django uh, based backend, then at least for staging environment, I, I'd still go to Heroku because it's it, it takes me it and it takes everyone here like an hour or even less to to set things up and yes. to get up and running, mm -hmm. uh, compared to uh, the other to the other choices. But still, I think Heroku can do better. And they can improve a lot, and there are features to be added. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to uh, actually having full flexibility and having more options, and actually wanting to do something more complex, then we go to Amazon, oh, AWS. Yes. yes. Yeah. So yeah, every time a customer uh, comes in that 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 already has a platform uh, yeah. running on uh, VPS, let's say. Yeah. And they're like, oh, we have one person that knows how to deploy it. We are like instantly moving the staging to Heroku. Yeah. Just because we want this flexibility and this, uh, all the quick benefits that Heroku is giving to us. And then thinking about the state, the production server. Uh, what to do there. Yeah. yeah later. Yeah. So Heroku is not giving us uh, any kind of um, simple storage solution. Yes. Meaning that in like 99% of the cases, you need to have an AWS account yes. while you're using Heroku. Yes. Which is a little bit inconvenient for, for, for us and for our clients saying, hey, you need to create a Heroku account, but you need to create an AWS account too for some of the services there, and we are going to be using both of them, right? Yes. Uh, and this basically create, makes it easier for, for us when we feel that is the right time to migrate more and more of the infrastructure from Heroku to, yes. to AWS. AWS yeah. Yeah. Why we are doing this? Well, because AWS is giving us more control over, yes. over everything. Sometimes with Heroku, you need to scale, but you, you don't need to scale as much as Heroku offers. You need to scale yeah. just, just a little bit. Yeah. Heroku doesn't give you this um, ability. Sometimes you need to fine tune something in the, let's say, the load balancer or yeah. the um, or the Postgres setup or the, I don't know. Or you just want your database to not be public on the internet. Well, <laughs> <laughs> the, well, yeah, okay. This, this, this may be a valid point. However, yeah. 
to be honest, we, for, for all this year, we didn't have any security issues with Heroku in terms of data security, leaking things, or, or something like that. You can see in the logs that uh, people are uh, constantly trying to guess the credentials for, for the Postgres, but yeah. Yeah, sure. but, but, but the password is like this long, so yeah. it, I think it's fine. Uh, uh, however, in, most of, in, in some cases, you definitely need uh, this uh, control. You need more yeah. control over your infrastructure, and that's the point, or, or Heroku is getting way more expensive than it should be. Yes. And that's the point where we start to think about migrating to AWS, yes. especially for production environments. And uh, yeah, I, for sure, AWS offers you more things. And as you said, we are already using it for S3 and for CloudFront and sending uh, for, emails. For SES, yeah, yeah for sending email emails. Uh, and then whenever we decide to move to AWS, then you, are, you have, again, two options. You can go the VM route. Mm-hmm where you just pick EC2 instances and then you're back to um, uh, Nginx, Gunicorn, and all, all that jazz. Yeah. Uh, or what we are actually doing recently is we are r- leveraging Docker. Yes. So we are deploying containers mm-hmm. v- via Docker on a suite of AWS services. A lot of them. Yeah, please. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Tell us more about AWS, it. AWS, it gives you all the control, but with all this control, there are a lot of things you need to learn, a lot of things you need to manage, and a, w- a lot more security yeah. risks you are basically taking because you're yeah. the one that I- that is controlling all of that. So, yeah, going with Docker, I think everyone can agree that's a great idea. Dockerizing yep. your Django project because it not only depends on a Python requ- on, on a Python dependencies, it depends on OS dependencies too. So it's a great idea to bundle everything together and push it to a, a Docker repository. Yeah, uh, we're using something called ECS, the Elastic Container Service. Okay, that is the service that is getting the um, Docker image from the Docker repository. And it's deploying it on uh, instances on the AWS infrastructure. Okay, so ECS, Elastic Container Service. Yes, and it combines a lot of things. There are something, some things called task definitions, basically the uh, templates that the ECS uses in order to spin up the machines. Uh, there is services. This is basically the thing that is keeping those machine, uh, this, this, these machines alive and restarts them and uh, kill, kills them if necessary. Uh, there is, uh, let's say, um, a load balancer you need to set yep. up yourself. There is uh, um, RDS, Relational Database Service, that yep. you need to, to set up in order to have your database up and running. Elastic Cache, if you want to use some kind of uh, caching yep. credits or, 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 or whatever. Uh, virtual private cloud in order to set up the networking the VPS, of, yeah. yeah VP VPC virtual private cloud VPC yeah VPC yeah that comes with security groups and uh, a bunch of other things that you need to truly understand and yeah you're set up. suddenly exposed again to things from system administration and mm-hmm. devops that mm-hmm. you need to you need to know what you're doing yes yes you need to definitely have done this a couple of times on the site when you start to do it for, for, for production. Route 53, of course, setting up domains, the uh, Elastic Certificate Service or whatever in order to take care for your certificates. Yep. Uh, and basically a lot, a lot of things. At the end of the day, it's most probably going to be cheaper than hosting on Heroku. Most probably? Most probably. I mean, it really depends on the scale, but if you're really on a, on a big scale, it is going to be cheaper. Yeah. It is going to be cheaper and you're going to have way more control. You can scale your... Um, Workers just just a little bit, not like three times, but just like twenty percent more would, would would be fine, and you will pay only for this twenty percent more. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but and of course, then you then you need to uh, set up of the monitoring there. So you need to get so the login. B- before, before we go to the monitoring, there's something that has a really cool name called Fargate. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What's Fargate? Well, Fargate is something that the Elastic Container Service uh, uses in order to deploy your Docker containers on the cloud without you actually managing the, vir- the virtual private servers uh, okay. underneath. And w- do you specify in case when you're deploying Django on ECS? Mm-hmm. Do you specify the region and where do you specify the region? Yes, you specify the region when you create your uh, ECS cluster. All right, so the uh, cluster lives in a specific region. Yes, and the cluster, okay. you can think as a cluster, uh, as, as a Heroku app. Basically, all okay. the processes okay. are living in one, in one cluster. Okay, all right. And who's, dealing the, who's, who's doing the reverse proxying? Uh, the uh, load balancer, which again, when you create it, you specify a region. Is it the elastic load balancer? Is it the elastic <laughs> load balancer, yeah. 
Pretty and it, it may be elastic application load balancer or just an elastic load balancer, different things, different use cases. Uh, All right. So uh, we are using the ELB yes. for reverse proxying, basically mm -hmm. taking care of the, the traffic. Mm -hmm. And then this thing uh, redirects to Fargate. Mm -hmm. And this runs whatever is defined as tasks in ECS. Yes. Yes. And there are services that are keeping those tasks alive. And yeah. that, and. Uh, uh, task definitions that are basically the templates from where the services create the tasks. All right, all right, yeah. And the thing is that each of those services, they charge in a different way. Yeah. So it's really hard to predict what is going to be the total cost for this project migrating to AWS. For example, the uh, load balancer charges on traffic. All right. That's why it's not a great idea to uh, proxy your static images as it's big files through the load balancer, right? And each and every service is charging on a different way. Even even the logging services, they are charging uh, by line, by yep. by by a megabyte. You know, different different way of charging. Yep. And uh, for sure, it's, it's it's overwhelming because the more services you use on Amazon on AWS, the more services you're going to use in order to combine everything, and yeah. you're kind of vendor locking in yourself. Mm -hmm. But I suppose there's this, like you you always vendor lock your lock in yourself, be it AWS or Azure or or Google Cloud. Yeah. And for example, CloudWatch uh, is the service that you use for monitoring monitoring everything. Yes. Which to be honest is quite painful <laughs> to to configure and use. Yeah. Uh, especially via the user interface. And what else? Well, there 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 are tons of services. Mm -hmm. The thing that I really like about AWS and it's a big plus against Heroku is that you have CloudFront and you can easily put CloudFront in front of your API and you can configure a web application firewall in order to handle some specific cases and handle uh, traffic spikes and bot attacks and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. With Heroku, you basically have to uh, move your domain to perhaps Cloudflare or similar service and do it there. Yeah, when, you, when it comes to security, again, AWS provides a lot of tools, a lot of a yeah. lot of features, but you need to to know them and be sure that you're using them in the right way. Yeah, which basically takes out the take take takes the control in your hands. Yeah, which is sometimes for, for good. scale for <laughs> yeah. scale. I think for scale, it's good to have uh, it's good to be running on AWS because of because of things like CloudFront where you mm -hmm. can even cache mm -hmm. and things like uh, the WAF web application firewall yes. and, and the rest of the services mm -hmm. there are mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and. Again, when we are talking about so much services, so much configuration that you need to deal with, uh, we, I guess, must be talking about uh, infrastructure as code. Yes. So I don't think there is any other way to manage such a complex uh, setup uh, by by hand. Because again, you're you're becoming the uh, the single bus factor that knows how everything yes. is set up. So what we do is using Terraform for um, infrastructure as code, uh, which is I'll be honest, it's a great tool yep. that helps us a lot setting up uh, Django projects on AWS. And another benefit is that we can reuse some of the configurations, yep. uh, meaning that if we have the uh, absolute straight and common case Django with Celery, Beat, uh, RDS on Postgres, and uh, Redis cache, yep. that is basically something that we can reuse as a giant piece of code and have it all over the place. And we yep. and, and whenever we find... Uh, uh, something that can be uh, improved in terms of setup, we can just copy it all over the place and yep. just run it and it's going to be fixed everywhere. Yeah, uh, for sure Terraform is, otherwise you need to be clicking around the console, which the new one or the old one <laughs> might or might not be a good experience depending on how you're feeling that given day. Yes. <laughs> Especially rotating uh, through the regions in order to see where your EC2 instances are. Mm -hmm. Perhaps mm -hmm. there is a marker way, but I'm still doing it like this. Well, anyway, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's that's uh, that's pretty much it. We have we have projects running on Heroku, mm -hmm. and we have projects projects running on AWS. Yes, we no longer have projects running on VMs. Yes, that's true. That's true. Yeah, because the uh, efforts that we put towards system administration and DevOps, right now we're focusing towards um, uh, AWS and understanding how to work with AWS and navigate the different services mm -hmm. uh, and doing infrastructure as a code. And perhaps we could mention Lambda, 
the AWS Lambda that uh, there there is a way that you can deploy your Django application there. Mm -hmm. And what are the benefits? Well, I wouldn't say that the benefits are so much around the Django application itself. Mm -hmm. I would say that sometimes salary is not what you need in terms of background tasks. Okay. And I see huge potential in terms of running background tasks with Lambdas. Okay. Uh, because of the scalability you have, yeah. you don't have to, if your traffic is not constant, if you have like zero traffic at night and like big spikes during the days, uh, you can definitely leverage um, uh, the AWS Lambda with some kind okay. of uh, uh, simple message queue or, or something. SQS, yep. Yeah, that you just put your tasks there and they're going to be executed as soon as possible. Uh, and yeah, sometimes just salary is not the right tool for your needs. Yep. It, it's not really often the case, but uh, we have seen huge uh, cost uh, efficiency changes in terms of migrating yeah. from salary to AWS Lambdas in some projects in some cases. And if you want to spin your entire Django app uh, running on Lambda, what else do you need? Do you need some kind of API gateway or router or who, who's, who's doing the reverse proxying? You need the, um, I think it's called API gateway, yeah, right. that is getting the request and triggering Lambdas whenever uh, cold booting it or uh, hot booting it, whatever. Yeah. Uh, just uh, spins the um, Django on, handling the request, and then getting it off again. Yeah. Uh, it is, in most cases, you need a cloud from distribution yes. uh, in front of your um, Elastic uh, API, gateway? API Gateway. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it works, but to be honest, I didn't see a lot of... Since we are using Django for creating APIs, yeah. we, we, we don't really have problems with the scalability of this level. All right. Instead, for for server side rendering, actually rendering HTMLs, that is where I that, that is the point I see. We 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 definitely need serverless because mm -hmm. this is a time consuming operation and this is the the heavy lifting of the application. And for this, most of the cases we use Next and uh, Vercel. So yep. using Django in Lambda with 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 Lambdas is probably great, but I myself didn't see a lot of use cases for this for now. I suppose it's the the scalability that that you're going to get from it. You well, don't have to think about it. Most probably yes, but then you need, but then you have another issues. I mean, yeah. uh, who is going to scale your database layer and handling all these lambdas, uh, creating requests yeah. to your database? And uh, but yeah, the the summary here is that all, all of this, uh, it's the general idea is to enable you to be able to scale your application horizontally, mm -hmm. uh, because this is how you can handle a lot of traffic. And then you're going to hit issues with your database, and then you need to scale your database horizontally, which is perhaps for a different episode and a yes. whole, whole other issue. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. And um, all of this always deployed via some kind of CI. We're relying on GitHub, GitHub Actions a lot. GitHub Actions, I think every project right now is using yeah, GitHub Actions GitHub. on our side. Which is extremely important because then we can have a procedure and a pipeline for deploying to production. Yes, and uh, rolling back if things go uh, go south, and it's it's not very it's it's not a good deployment. And what else? Well, you just need to know the differences and take uh, uh, educated um, guesses on when to use what. All Hero right, Heroku is great for start, great for MVP, great for staging servers, great for production if you are not like too big of a scale. Yeah, AWS gives you all the control, but you need to know how to use this control, yeah. and you need to uh, be really mindful about what you're doing because you may take the things in a wrong way and uh, yeah. leak data, um, take take down your system with just a yeah. single press of a button, uh, and going with virtual private servers and setting up the things your way is probably. I would say the most cost efficient thing to do in yes. terms of we are not paying a lot for servers. Yes. But you definitely need someone to to know how everything is set yes. up and basically have a full-time DevOps for this. Yeah, if you, you're going to need full-time system administrators and DevOps for this. Perhaps it's the most cost efficient server at a certain level. And uh yeah, my, my summary is basically the same. Start with Heroku and then figure out when to move to AWS. Or with a Heroku-like service, because there are or with the Heroku-like yeah, service. Yeah. There are a lot of services now that are competing with Heroku. I don't think that any of them is on this level yet, yeah. but I guess they're getting there. I suppose so. Yeah. And uh, should we mention and talk about Kubernetes or not now? Well, I would say that the Kubernetes is just uh, if you don't want to go with ECS, you can go with AWS Kubernetes yeah. uh, stack and. 
It's kind of the same. I think it's the same. All I mean, right. I, I don't see a lot of different things, just a different technology, different way of working. It's probably more uh, non-vendor locked because the major cloud providers yes. have their uh, Kubernetes implementation and you can use it. Uh, not as the ECS, it's just yes. an AWS thing. But I would say that all the benefits and all the downsides are basically the same as using ECS, AWS ECS. Got it, got it. All right. Well, I think that's that's about it uh, for, for deploying Django. Uh, we've went through different phases, different stages. We're still at uh, Heroku plus AWS, mm -hmm. and we're still learning and getting better at AWS. Yes. Uh, and... That's about it, I think, for episode number nine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the blind jungle is not so easy. Keep it in mind and yep. uh, do the proper research when, whenever you're deploying a Django project. Yes, and for the next episode, episode number 10, we're going to do a special one. It's going to be the final for the season. And we're just going to answer your questions. So in case you have any questions, just write it down either on uh, LinkedIn or under uh, our one of our YouTube videos, and we'll do our best in order to provide some kind of an answer. And uh, please, let's get to 10 questions so we can have a content for a 30-minute episode. And of course, if you like what you're watching or hearing, like and subscribe, because we are going to produce a lot of interesting content this year. Right, Teddy? Yes. And uh, thank you for watching. Cheers. <laughs>